We want to say thank you for listening to Padres Hot Tub. Hey, it's a choice every time to click play on any podcast, and we're thankful you clicked play on ours. If you have an opportunity in your podcast platform to offer us a review, a five-star, quick little written thing, every one of those helps to draw new audience to the show. If you're a regular listener to the show and you'd like to support us a little bit further, we'd appreciate it if you did so. It really would help us out. Patreon.com slash Padres Hot Tub is the way to do that. Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Padres Hot Tub. That's the platform we use. We have close to 400 folks now uh, who help support this show a little bit financially, month by month, $5, sometimes more. And and guys, there's there's levels. There's levels of rewards. There's levels of involvement. But I, I think we always agree. We just want to make sure that whatever you... Uh, offer in support it's something that you wind up at the end of the month saying that was worth it yeah absolutely um, I, go ahead chris no it's all you rafe i uh i just got to spend the morning with a uh with a patron of ours uh playing golf that we i never would have been connected with him if we uh hadn't met over phd um you know discord community um we i, I think this is something i i do don't feel like we bring up enough. You get the show earlier if you're a patron. You get the show 12 hours before anyone else gets it, um, as well as getting it ad-free. Uh, we just also started uploading the videos that you're hopefully watching on YouTube right now on our Discord, uh, excuse me, on our Patreon ad-free. Um, so, you know, you don't have to watch this part that you're dealing with right now. Uh, you can, uh, you know, have your own, uh, uh, you know, experience with PHT. Uh, so please, we hop in the tub join us we miss you come where there's a spot right here for you plus it is baseball season now which means the ticket marketplace is wide open we've got patrons that can't make it to a ball game and are finding those tickets to another patron's hands making the right kind of good deals to take you off of the secondary ticket marketplace like a, a seat geek etc and hey for big patrons for huge patrons and for regular patrons quite often I'll throw my season tickets up there just as a giveaway to folks uh, for as a thank you for supporting. I'm offering a couple of seats next to me for Monday's game to big patrons this uh, upcoming week as well. So find something there for you. I think certainly the Discord is worth the price of admission all by itself. Patreon.com slash Padres Hot Tub. And however you do it, we say thank you for supporting the show. Hot tub, everybody. It's Craig, it's Chris, it's Rafi, the dancing fools are here. Here, I'll do one. Okay, <laughs> there we go. On the show tonight, we're going to react to and overreact to the four game split with San Francisco, look around the first weekend of MLB, and offer our various thoughts on what's happening with the club from the bullpen to the bottom of the lineup uh, and everything in between. Uh, guys, Three and three. You faced two good teams, the Dodgers and the Giants. You faced them in different circumstances, uh, including some wacky weather over the course of this weekend. You wind up with a four game split against the Giants. Uh, I'll, I'll just say, I think this is what it's going to be like all year. I think these teams are going to beat each other up all year long. And I think this is going to be a typical series by the end of the year. I think that's probably a pretty good pr prediction, Craig. Um, it, you just saw the lineup kind of show up differently depending on who they were facing on the mound that day. And that speaks for our guys as well. When you Darvish is pitching like he was, it was hard for other teams to hit. And when Jordan Wicks was spot in the corner at 99, he was hard for the Padres guys to hit. Uh, we haven't even seen the Diamondbacks yet. They're at the top of the division, but it's going to look the same way when we face them. Uh, hopefully. Uh, against the upcoming Cardinals, who can't seem to put away games even when we want them to, they they can they can finally finally win a series. Yeah, I mean, if you had told me before, 
you know, season started, we'd be three and three after the first two series. I'd be happy with it. You know, I, I, I think uh, two and four would have obviously left a bad taste in my mouth. Four and two would have been fantastic. Three and three is about what I expected. It's about what I hope for. I'm glad that we pulled it off. And it just goes to show I was I was kind of uh, fussing around on fan graphs uh, on Friday after our second opening day win when we were uh, two and one at that point. And uh, prior to that game, we had playoff odds, according to them, according to Fangraphs, at 40%. After we beat the Giants on Thursday, it was uh, 45%. So that one game was a 5% swing in our playoff odds. That was game three of 162. And like I, I think it was like a whole, we learned last year, the whole narrative of well, you know, it's early still. It's early. Remember that? <laughs> Remember when we were like, it's past Memorial Day, and we're like, it's not early anymore. Like, this is kind of a problem. Uh, I just like, we're going to have a lot of these games in the first month or two of the season against the Giants and the and the Diamondbacks, and I truly think that, like, our future, our, you know, playoff hopes hinge on those, I guess this now it's 24 games. It's 12 against each of them, 24 games. Like, I think we're going to find out what our season is in the span of those 24 games. Getting off to a great start would do a, a world of good for the San Diego Padres. There's no question about that. Um, so let's go game by game through the series. And I think that's going to get us to almost every one of the discussion topics that each of the three of us want to get to on this evening's show. Uh, if you want to hear what we had to say about opening day, I invite you to check out the the podcast one back in your feed, uh, especially if you're on the free feed, which was our group therapy podcast. We recorded that live with patrons uh, on Thursday evening after the Padres beat the Giants six to four. So uh, we'll leave that one in the rearview mirror. Uh, Friday started really poorly as Joe Musgrove went out there and had to face the whole Giants lineup in the first inning, uh, settled down a little bit from there and was a, at least able to pitch, uh, I believe, into one out into the sixth. But uh, it was another rough outing for Joe Musgrove. And really, he had a rough start to the spring, and then he had a rough start in Korea, and he's had a rough start now at home. And it's Joe Musgrove, and none of us are going to throw him overboard or, or demote him to the bullpen or anything ridiculous. But I'm looking forward to his first good start. Yeah. Um, it seems as though uh, I'm feeling a little bit of pressing when I watch Joe Musgrove um, on his uh, part. It's a lot of, I mean, his stuff is still fantastic. You know what I mean? Like you, you watch his slider spin and you watch his cutter throw. Like I, he's a great pitcher, but the the issue right now um, that I'm seeing that stands out to me the most is that his velocity is down from last season. Um, his velocity is he's hovering around 91 92 on his fastball when he was more of a 93 94 guy before and his fastball is just getting demolished and if he can't reliably throw his fastball which you know as great as his breaking stuff is he's trying to get guys to chase he's not throwing those pitches reliably for strikes if he can't play off that fastball he's kind of screwed and so i am looking forward hopefully to a little bit more relaxation hopefully a start against uh some lesser teams We'll do the trick. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, I in the concernometer for Joe, uh, I would put him at like a, I put myself at like a four and a half, like just slightly below. Like, yeah, I'm a little concerned, but you know, we'll see. I'm even lower than that because he said his shoes weren't fitting him too well. So he had to change them. I guess they weren't his slider throwing shoes because he wasn't throwing his slider at all. He was first. hanging everything. Oh, oh my God. Brutal. In that first inning, everything was waist high or above. It was, yeah. it was awful. Yeah. But we saw him settle into a rhythm and get comfortable as the season progresses. I know he'll be able to come out of the starting gate and do that. I don't think Joe Musgrove is going to have a, uh, what is it? A 9.72 ERA come, come three weeks from now. I, I think the dude is going to post a quality start in the next three or four. Not worried about Joe at all. Yeah, no, I mean, just worth noting, right? Yeah. We're, we're going game by game. He didn't have a good outing no. that directly contributed to the team losing. Kyle Harrison was good. And his second in a row, you know, he, he yeah. didn't look good in Korea either. 
Yeah. And he didn't look good in the spring either. And it was like, don't worry about it. I'm working on things. But the only good outing Joe Musgrove had in the spring was one no one saw. It was it was one that was just written about. He had a five inning great outing on the B great field against the B team. You know, uh, the games that were televised were not very good. Uh, Kyle Harrison was good for the Giants. And honestly, you know, we'll talk about them more, but Giants were better than I thought they'd be over the course of the weekend. One of the things that impressed me was Harrison. He's that second year pitcher, right? He he was up last year. He got his feet wet. He had an ERA over four, but he comes at you from a tough angle. He's a left-hander who throws hard. He's got a good breaking ball. Uh, and there's a reason that they started him second in their yeah. rotation. I mean, it's because Blake Snell's not ready. But the other reason is they think highly of him and they they think that he can be very successful this year. And I thought, I thought he was pretty damn good. He was really aggressive. It seemed like he was attacking Padres pitchers. I don't have his, his strike to ball. There it is right there. 54 of his 76 pitches were strikes. So he wasn't messing around with Padres pitchers. He was going right after him and trusting him stuff. He's, the top left-handed prospect in the game coming into last year. He's no one to, to you know, sniff at. But uh, Jordan Hicks, starting pitcher Jordan Hicks was also kind of a surprise. Putting up, yeah. what, what did he throw 90 pitches? I mean, yeah. good for my keeper league team, but... Oh, gross. N- not great for the Padres. Yeah. Hey, listen, Hicks looked really good. Hicks has always had a ton of talent. When a when a reliever, especially a super power reliever, is being converted into a starter and his first start he pitches 90 something pitches. 81. Let's, okay, let's check back after six starts. Let's check back after 12 starts to yeah. see where Jordan Hicks is at because the first one might be the best one. You never know. Um, but the one other thing before we jump Friday completely. I don't. I can't walk away from that. Fernando Tatis Jr. hit two absolute fucking tanks on Friday, including one that went a hundred, I believe, sixteen. It was or a hundred fifteen point something miles an hour. It was, I believe, his hardest ever hit home run. Uh, and so now we've seen Tatis's hardest hit single and hardest hit homer this year. And then he took one off of the ridiculous Under Armour uh, Rogers twin. And he put it out almost as hard. And it was it was crazy. It was above the strike zone. It came from like the shoe top up above. And then he hit it all the way over there. So for all of the Tatis will never be the same haters. Like I thought that was an incredible data point in terms of look at the power that he is generating in the bat speed. Yeah. And I mean, just looking at uh, Tatis's stat line through the first what is it, six games now? Um, he's slashing 304, 360, 609. And uh, I know it's early and I know it's a small sample size, but like his rookie year numbers were not far off from that. And like, I, I don't know that he's going to be able to sustain, a, you know, an above 300 average and an above 600 slugging percentage. But I would not be shocked if he gets close to either of those things. And so I think of all the people uh, you know, all the guys on our team so far and their performances, I think his stat line is uh, obviously at probably a 70 or 80th percentile outcome, um, but it's something I could see him sustaining this year. So it, it's been cool to see that so far. I absolutely could, too. And he was he's been hitting the ball hard all season, but he was kind of putting it into the ground at first. He got his first at bat Friday into the air, and then it seemed like it was done. Like he had to hit that one a little too high. And then the next two balls he hit were home runs. His WRC plus right now is 162. I am very confident from what we've seen early on. If dude stays healthy, it's going to be right up there. I'm a lot more confident in his 162 than I am Jake Cronenworth's 167 or Tyler Wade's 156. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll talk about all those guys, I'm sure, uh, as we continue because the Padres. We're in a game on Friday, even with the bad start for Musgrove, but they 
outside of the homers by Tatis and Machado that night, they couldn't generate any more offense. Bottom of the lineup didn't do anything. And then the bullpen fell apart. The rule they five had that kick- bases loaded moment. Wasn't that Friday night where they had bases loaded one out and couldn't score a run. And then, yes. And then uh Kolek came in the rule five kid and he wasn't good. And then Avila came in and he gave up a second tank to Matt Chapman, who was annoying and reminded you that those free agent, signings do cost the Padres games. That was a game that Matt Chapman kind of beat the Padres with two homers uh, in a game. Saturday was mostly a very similar game to Friday. Dylan Cease wasn't as bad as Joe Musgrove, but he wasn't great. And I honestly, I thought Cease gave us what you would have expected Blake Snell to give you in a first start. A little wild, a little erratic, shows you that great slider. And in the end, pitched what? Three and a third or four innings? Four and a third. Four and a third. There you go. Four and two so, thirds. So, yeah, didn't get to five. So, I mean, that that's kind of like what you'd expect from Blake the first time out. And Cease has really good stuff. I'm not going to judge it too much. He was just okay, but not great. And he did get a little unlucky in the first inning when Profar and Wade went for a ball that dumped right in between them. And neither one of them really wanted to go right at it because they were worried about running into the other. So it was there, there was a little unluck in there as well. Overall, I'm still thrilled Dylan Cease is on the team. Oh, yeah. Heck yeah. I mean, um, I stand by what I said on group therapy on Thursday night, which is that you looked at the weekend and you looked at the pitching matchups and you had to give the Padres the advantage. I think I said in all four games. Um, the, the, the thing about Kyle Harrison is, um, he, the scouting report on him is he's a fastball guy. Um, and he threw his fastball 72% of the time on Friday night, something like that. The Padres just couldn't hit it. Like they just like, he just beat them. You know what I mean? Like, that's just, that's just what it was. Um, you know, you knew you were going to get the same thing with Jordan Hicks on Saturday night. And so that to me is, well, there's a theme there. (laughs) <laughs> Padres aren't catching up to fastballs early out of the gate this year. And I mean, just this is pure eye test stuff now. This is not even data, but like, what have the Padres been banging? Hangers. Like, that's just like what they've been hitting. They've been hitting breaking balls. Um, I can't, you know, I'm sure that there were, but like, it, it, to, to me, what I think of the, the big hits from this weekend, it's Machado crushing mistakes, Tatis crushing mistakes. Like, I, I'm not, uh, you know, remembering any sort of like, high cheese, you know, high and tight fastballs or anything, you know, getting crushed. Um, do I think we'll get there? Sure. Um, but two fastball guys beating us on back to back nights, I, I can't I'm not gonna not notice that trend. Um and then what happened today out of the gate, they had Jeffries out there who was a, you know, the, the the bullpen guy for the Giants or, you know, whatever. They were just kind of piecing together the the day today and he was throwing a bunch of breaking shit and it was getting, you know, it was getting smashed. So that's something I'm going to look to for the Cardinal series. I don't uh, I'll look it up so that I'll have it in a second. But like depending on who the, the Cardinal starters are going to be, um, that could pretend poorly. That could pretend good. It's um, uh, so we'll see. it's Gibby, Michaelis and Zach Thompson. I mean, that none of those guys are heat seeking missile throwers. No. So, <laughs> <laughs> So uh, well, maybe that's a good thing for us, um, but I'll be curious in the next couple of weeks how we do against fastballs until we get to our trip to L.A. in like a, you know, 10 or 11 days. And, uh, you know, obviously we'll face a lot of heat up in L.A. Uh, Tom Cosgrove was terrible on Saturday uh, and a little unfortunate in between the two long homers that he allowed, including a Michael Conforto Grand Slam that put the game completely out of reach, which was very unfortunate because then the game became not out of reach when the Padres hit two homers in the ninth inning, Eggie Rosario and Graham Pauly. Graham Pauly, who finally got off the bench, gets a, a, a bomb off the foul pole, and then becomes the starter on Sunday and at least gets another hit and and a run scored uh, coming in on a Merrill double on Sunday when the Padres go absolutely hog wild, as you mentioned, and put 12 runs up in the first three innings and cruise to a 13-4 win uh, to not only wrap up the split 
but to Pythagorean win the series. Pythagorean. <laughs> Pythagorean. That's all we care about. Get that we Pythagorean won that series. That's it. Give us the slide rule. We did it. Um, but <sighs> Michael King was a little weird on Sunday. Uh, seven Wild. blocks. Yeah. Couldn't control his stuff. Uh, his, I, I felt like he was really getting beat on his fastball. Uh, and maybe it's because his breaking stuff was so wild that everyone was just spinning on it. Um, I'm not sure, but I wanted to, you know, I mentioned that, but I want to go back to Pauly because I think there's just no, I mean, Tyler, the creator, we did the whole thing. It was a good bit. It lasted three days. That's longer than I thought it would last. Um, Grand Pauly should either be starting in AAA or he should be starting in the major leagues. And right now he should be starting in the major leagues. He should at that least part. be the platoon. Like he should at least be the platoon against right-handed hit starters. Right. Which takes right. weight out of the equation. So well, you don't, you know. the thing is, I, I'd be very curious at about an on the record, candid assessment of his abilities in the left in left field, because you could do left field or third base. Like supposedly he's a bit of a liability at both places. Um, in his most comfortable position being second base, where Xander Bogarts is playing. So you're right, Craig. If you're not gonna if you're gonna use him like he's done so far, one start in six games, you might be hurting what could be a potentially valuable bat down the road by not letting the guy get reps day in and day out, or at least every other day. Like if you're not gonna start him, platoon him because he's got talent. The team likes him. He turned on two really sharp inside pitches, both for his home run and his hit today. You know, the the hit he got today was a solid two inches inside. And his hands are just super quick and got to it in a way that I don't think you see out of uh, kind of raw hitters. And, um, yeah, you're right. He's got to play if he's going to be here. Yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of this what are we doing thing i will say about the left field piece uh mike Schultz gave a really thoughtful answer when he was asked about this yesterday where he basically said in i'm paraphrasing him now but like we don't want to will myers him like we don't want to he the, what he actually said was like we don't want to put him on the carousel and i mike Schultz, as someone who was like a career minor league manager like i actually yeah. like really trust him in terms of uh you know handling our young talent and 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 doing what's best for them that being said i know like this is the call where like obviously last year we knew that melvin and aj butted heads and a lot of it was over like aj being too controlling aj and mike schilt they're of some sort of mind meld is at least what we're being sold and we don't know what the lineup discussions are we don't know what the lineup control is but like for me like the Padres organization does not have an interest in developing Tyler Wade into a player. And they do have an interest in developing Eggy Rosario and Graham Pauly into a player. And I, I don't know. I know we're like pro Eggy on this podcast, but Eggy frustrated the shit out of me this weekend by just trying to do too much. And I like Pauly is the guy who clearly has the highest floor from a hit tool standpoint. And he's a lefty bat. He's something that this lineup desperately needs. Um, you know, I'm not going to go crazy over one hit, but that home run was sexy. Like that was really cool. So was going. Eggies. Yeah, but I, but I'm way more excited to watch Graham Pauly hit than I am to watch Eggy Rosario hit. Like when Graham Pauly hits, I'm like, oh, this is like, this could be a future everyday big leaguer. And I just don't, when I watch Eggy, I just don't have, you know, Eggy's going to be a, a, a utility guy. And that's like, that's what his that's what his future is in my opinion and so it's like as an organization like if we're going to do the reps like what are we doing that's just my question if we're going to put tyler wade in there like why like why i just don't why? i don't get it yeah i mean I, I i truly think that they didn't want to put him in the opening day lineup for a pressure standpoint i think wade played well that game so they let him play the next game he played well that game so they let him play the next game, and he played well that game. So they let him play the next game. But now that's that. Like, I'm sorry. It's the it's the tough life of a major league journeyman like Tyler Wade. But you literally have to contribute to the team every day. Uh, and 
when we start to see the cracks in the armor, we go, okay, there's someone else who can contribute a little more, but it's more of who's the organizational asset. And that's the point that you made and we all made. So we don't have to remake it. Uh, there's an organizational asset. There's a career journeyman playing. One over the other is criminal misconduct and it must be corrected. And I know Mike Schilt doesn't want to have a raw rookie on the bench as his number one pinch hit option. So. Yeah. Tyler Wade, that's a happen. great place for Tyler Wade. That's a great right. place. Like if you're going to have him be your death piece, great. Just don't have the guy who is 23 years old coming off being the minor league player of the year for the organization. Don't have him sitting on the bench. The one thing Grand Pauly needs to work on for sure is his helmet size. His helmet <laughs> is one size too big. Him and and every time he Kim. swings, it goes cockeyed on yeah. him and it covers up one of his eyes. So he really should fix that. His, <laughs> his head is not quite as big as he thinks it is. Although if everyone pumps him up, maybe his head will grow uh, just, just a little bit. Uh, when Pauly got on, Jackson Merrill brought him in. Jackson Merrill had a couple of hits today. That was today. such a fun moment. It was. And the thing I would say about Jackson Merrill is, boy, he's looked super smooth in center field. I haven't one time yet in six games been worried about a ball that went to center field. Kid's 6'4". He's very fast. He, he covers some ground. What I've seen from Jackson Merrill is just being in the place to make the catch. Like he's he's running to get to the place to make the catch. Maybe he hasn't had to have the hardest plays yet. I'm sure there's something, you know, in the future that, that'll get everyone yelling and screaming. But I think so far, he has completely resembled a functional major league center fielder. And it's not just getting to the right place, it's being in the right position to make a throw in once he makes the catch. He's doing these little fundamental things that look so smooth and polished that it blows my mind that he's not only learning center field, the hardest position in the outfield, he's learning outfield. This dude never played a position other than shortstop uh, before last fall. So kudos to the guy for putting in the work. Thus far, I mean, this could change over a series with the Cardinals. But I trust him in center field just as much as Jose Azokar or a little bit more. I'm not so sure that uh, Jackson Merrill has the same result on that borderline Matt Chapman home run a few days ago. He's got a couple of inches on the guy regardless. So no, that, uh, that lady was taking it off the shoulder no matter what. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> she I was going to wear that ball. I think Jackson could have saved her. Action Jackson could have. No, nope, no. Nope. She was wearing her. that ball no matter what. That was. <laughs> I think I went to high school with her, by the way. What? I was like, right. What? My, my sister texted me. My sister was watching the game too. And she was like, I think this girl was in the grade between us. And I, lo I like looked and I was like, I look, I, I did like a slow mo on the. Anyway, this is ridiculous. But yeah, that's a, this is a small world. Jackson Merrill, I think, hasn't really. I'm getting it back on track. <laughs> Jackson Merrill, I don't think has truly been tested yet. So I'm not willing to. No, I agree. I, I think he's been he's been he's done what's been needed for him right now. Um, I, what I do want to talk about on the offensive side is he got real unlucky this weekend. He was smoking the ball and was yeah. smoking the ball right into gloves. And I got a lot of, uh, I was driving home. Uh, I was listening to Jesse and Tony, you know, doing the grocery shopping, you know, driving home and everything when I was, when the game was on this afternoon and I got a lot of push notifications because we scored a lot of runs, but by far and away that my favorite push notification that I got was Jackson Merrill doubles Graham Polly scores. Because yeah. I was like, I had this moment right there where I was like, when is the last time that we had two rookie position players that were interplaying? Like, I think it must have been Tatis and Luis Urias when when they came up. Right. Like, well, and, yeah, Urias wasn't up at first. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he didn't come up at first and he was here for a hot second. And it's like, who before that? I mean, now we're getting into the Renfro, Aswahe, Hedges, wave of talent <laughs> sort of thing. And like, I, it's just like, it's cool. It's cool to have like these young guns on the team that are bringing fire and energy, like watching how excited Jackson Merrill was when Grandpa Lee hit his home run for a game that we were going to lose. Like, I was just like, this is an energy that was clearly missing from last year. 
And so I, you know, riding on the back of our conversation, like, I just want to get these guys in the game. I just think it's just good for the vets to be around them, too. Rafey, just to piggyback in a language you speak a whole lot better than I do, Jackson's ex uh, Woba right now is 321. His actual weighted Oba is 225. Expected slug is 457. Actual slug is 214. His expecting batted average is almost 100 points higher than it actually is. So you're absolutely right. 22% barrel percentage. I really think the dude's going to end up being a, a clear benefit to the team, at least offensively, than its center field player in the last few years. I, I think he's eventually going to be a star. Like he, he has the, the skills are, are pretty damn clear. He's 20 years old. He's 20 years old. He's handling, <laughs> so a brand new po- he's handling a brand new position and not for nothing, guys. He walked a second time this week. If Jackson Merrill walks twice a week, he'll have twice. He, if he if Jackson Merrill walks twice a week, he'll have 50 walks plus at the end of the year. If Jackson Merrill walks 50 times this year, learning a new position at age 20 with his bat to ball skills, this guy is going to be a five, six war player in a year or two. Like, I'm not kidding. His bat to ball skill is ridiculous, but I have been extremely not worried, but I have been cognizant that his skill set minus plate discipline is going to equal a player who is going to have an on-base percentage 20, 30 points above his batting average. So if he hits 260, he'll have a 280 batting average. And, and, or if he hits 220, he'll have a 250 on-base percentage. You know what I mean? And and so him showing, he had some really good at-bats in the walks that he's drawn. Like, he's having good at-bats. I know there's a struggle coming. The league's going to get tape on him. Every every team's going to see him in person and they'll adjust to him. But there's no question that the skills are there. You know what? Here's the thing. My wife and I have been dating for a little over 20 years. If we would have like uh, gotten freaky on our first date and our baby was like pretty premature, he could be our baby. Jackson Merrill could be my baby. No idea where you were going, and he's young. That's all. He's just young, and it blows my mind. That's all. He could be my baby, Craig. I sincerely hope this is someone's first episode listening to Padres Hot Tub, <laughs> and to be like, this is this is the metric by which we gauge how old our players are. He could be my baby, right? Would uh, 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 think about baseball. he's tall think enough. Baseball. Okay, enough. <laughs> <laughs> enough um so we're almost one time through the rotation i i can't wait to be out there monday to support the waldron cauldron in person i think if if the team or t public or breaking t isn't going to do it i think we need to create the waldron cauldron t-shirt and sell it right away uh because good call Craig. i want to wear it good call yeah i want to wear it for me if nothing else, uh, but nothing has been surprising yet. You's had two starts and you, I think, look the best. Joe's had two starts and Joe hasn't looked good yet. So a little bit concerning. And the other guys gave me what I thought were requisite weird first starts for guys who have flown to Korea and back and didn't have a full spring training and we're going to go 80 pitches no matter what. Like, I think we kind of got a kind of normal thing. I'm not worried about the rotation. The rotation needs to be the Padres' number one strength this year, them and and the big three. Uh, That needs to be the strengths of this team. The one thing that I think we're learning after a week of play is that uh, the hidden cost of the Dylan Cease trade was moving Stephen Wilson. Mm. Because Robert Suarez, all right, he's the closer. But the number two power right-handed bullpen arm is not there for San Diego. And right now, it's just a hot mess. And they tried Johnny Brito, and that didn't work. And then Brito the other day pitched long relief, and that seemed fine. So, like, maybe that's what he should do. Steven Kolick, I'm sorry. No. 
No, send him back to Seattle. Like the problem with having a bad pitcher on your team is you're going to use him. And Kolick has pitched twice this weekend, and that's two. That's at least one time too many. Like he pitched in a in a leverage situation. That's he should not know. And, and you know, is it De Los Santos has been fine the first time out? Does he need He's to get good. more time? Yeah, like this is this is an open competition, and you don't want to have that in the season. We, we are one right-handed power reliever short right now. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I I personally have about no confidence in this bullpen. Like, uh, it just in terms of like, I don't feel like any of our leads are safe right now. Um, I just want to note this does not include today's stats from the um Sunday game against the Giants. Uh, in the first five contests of the season, the Padres have an eight forty nine ERA from their bullpen. Um, and uh, I uh. Scientifically, I have to say that's uh, that's bad. Um, so, <laughs> uh, you know, obviously, we'll accept. That's, uh, we'll accept bad. Yes. Yeah, we'll we'll accept bad. Um, now, of course, the Dodgers bullpen going into today had a six twenty six ERA. I don't. I don't. I will be willing to wager that neither of those teams will have that high of an ERA from their bullpens as the year goes on. Um, but you know, we'll, I hopefully we'll talk about left field later on. But uh, talk when you talk about like making holes in the team and then not fixing those holes, like I do think bullpen, you know, with the departure of Hader and then trading Stephen Wilson, like, and then you know you can say whatever you want about Eniel De Los Santos, but you can argue trading Scott Barlow, like you make a hole and you don't fix it, and then the hole is still there and it's glaring and the sun is poking through and it all of a sudden it's April tomorrow. You know what I mean? It's obvious the team was expecting Tom Cosgrove to be the form that he was in 2023, when in fact he has been uh, not a Mogli, but rather the gremlins that pop up out of the Mogli once it gets wet. Um, he's been really bad, blowing up a game or two. I And it's tough. I think this is going to be the part of the club where we see the most early movement, just because of the optionality of a lot of the players. And maybe Kolick goes back to Seattle, uh, but they had guys who were at least being effective in spring. Adrian Morahone led the league in stuff. He's another lefty. He's not a righty, but he is a power arm that, that can come in. And uh, Estrada, though he was also wild, gave up too many walks, had vicious stuff. So I, I think you're right, Rafe. You can't trust it right now, but I do trust that we're going to see movement. Whether I don't, it's not going to be outside help, but it is going to be within the org. And I, I, I don't think they should wait very long because, like you said, uh, every game matters. We can't play the it's early game. It has to be you're not performing. You got to go. Let's see what Randy Vasquez has got. Yeah, he could be an option. We don't know. There could be someone else that emerges from the weeds over time. But Wilson was a guy that you could plug in there and pitch 65 times this year uh, and put him into some leverage situations and count on him. And, and that's gone and it hasn't been replaced. So uh, until it is, we're going to have that wobble. Now I'm, I've got a little concern about Suarez versus left-handed power. Uh, Matsui's look great. Peralta finally got in, look good. You know, Costco, yeah, one out. But like, should we actually pitch Tom Crossgrove every game? I I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe not I every th- single game. Maybe that's. I think maybe it that's shows a little it was part much. of the plan, right? Like they they were ready to lean on the kid. He's first one out almost every time. Like, hey, we were in trouble. Go get Cosgrove with a crazy sweeper. So, yeah, I, I'm I'm concerned as well, but uh. I still think I, you know, I still kind of like the back. I just feel like my depth of trust in the bullpen is about three deep right now. And that's a problem. Uh, yeah. Continuing. I have to say. Jake Cronenworth is off to a hell of a start. <laughs> he is killing it. He his swing looks amazing. He is not getting fluky hits. He is smashing the ball. Uh, he is hanging in there. He looks 
great. And as many times as I have had to point out over the last two years, Jake Cronenworth's decline, I've never wanted him to be bad. I want him to be great all the time. Jake Cronenworth has looked great, great so far this year. And I know we're going to get to a couple of things where we might start picking on some early personnel decisions by Mike Schilt, but he has put Jake Cronenworth in the three spot. He he hung him in there against the left-hander. Crony got a hit against the left-hander. He has been great. Yeah. I mean, he, uh, you know, I talked earlier about fastballs and the team not be really being able to catch up to them and, you know, having trouble. Um, yeah, Jake's been turning on inside pitches in a way that, I know was in his bag, but in the with the consistency he's been doing it Dude. in both Korea and here, like it's fantastic. And specifically against lefties, which I I don't know that he was ever someone who suffered hugely in a platoon split situation. Um, but he's I I have nothing but like let's keep it up. Like you know let's let's talk about it in two weeks. Let's see how he's doing in two weeks. But like so far, this is great. And if he's going to produce like this, like I feel fantastic about him at being at first base. Uh, the crone zone is two places. It's number one, the low and inside pitch that the dude turns on and puts right over the first baseman's head for a double into the right field corner. And it's also any ball within his reach because he has played fantastic defense at first base. Um, not to spread the credit, but Ha Sung Kim at shortstop has been so damn refreshing as an entertainment product. Having that dude at shortstop is of a caliber that I, the Padres haven't had, I don't think, since Ozzy Smith. It is beautiful to watch him play. And Xander Bogarts has been great at second base. He's looked great on his turns. He's gotten to balls. He's been smart in the infield. So with Cronenworth playing a great glove at first, playing a shortstop caliber first base position, Xander Bogarts at second base playing a shortstop caliber second base position, and Hassan Kim playing an all-galaxy caliber shortstop when Manny Machado returns and we don't have to put up with Tyler Wade or Eggy Rosario at third base this infield is going to be locked down not to steal from Tyler Wade but that will be a truly locked in infield uh I love it um what I don't necessarily love I mean listen coming into the season I said I think the Padres are a hitter short and I still think the Padres are a hitter short. And I'm completely willing to give up the ghost on Tommy Pham. Uh, one thing I know about Tommy Pham is that he is such a polarizing player within the Padres community that even if we did sign him, it, it's it's going to be a thing. And right now, we're kind of a good vibes team, and I don't need that thing. I, I was just trying to find it as you were speaking, Chris, and I haven't found it yet. But somebody in the Discord said, that that Kim in a post game interview today said that Jurix and Profar addressed the team. Yep, before the game. Pr- prior to the game today, our our vibes king, Jurix and Profar, and uh, you know, I I saw on your list of topics, uh, Jurix and Profar is a problem, Rafi, and mm. like Jurix and Profar hitting sixth against left handers, I definitely agree is a problem. Like that is not. <laughs> what I want in my big league lineup, but pro far on the left side, I don't know. Like his numbers have been okay so far. And if he's got that level of, of clout within the team, his defense has been fine. I don't, he's not a six hitter. We're a hitters light. I'd like that to be Brandon belt, but as an eight hitter, I think I'd be, I don't know. I guess I'm okay with it so far. Yeah. Explain Rafe. Explain yourself. What is the problem here? Is it three bodies? It's <laughs> the problem is is that Jerks and Profar should not be the starting left fielder for a playoff contending team. That's the just that's full stop. That's my like do would I like Jerks and Profar on this team as the twenty fifth or twenty sixth man, like playing and, and being the first guy to come in and, and uh you know, he can fit you know, he is a utility player. He is an infielder, he's been converted to outfield. He could play pretty much anywhere on the diamond. And like him being a, a depth piece for us? Absolutely. Like, 100%. Him being the starting left fielder, a traditional, like, power, power position for us. And also, like, I don't know. Like, I, I'm not going to shit on his his batting and write it off his small sample and then, you know, 
when his when his hitting's been good so far. But his fielding in small sample hasn't been great, uh, from from in my opinion. And so I I just think that as a team, I don't think it's asking too much to say that we should have higher expectations of like who our left field pers- personnel is. Like his stat line right now, Shirks and Profar stat line. As I'm switching over tabs and pulling it up, he's hitting 294, 455, 353. That OBP very high because he's walked four times already this season. What you talking um, about, hater? He's going to get 110 walks <laughs> and score 98 runs. Sounds great. So he's, he's going to be like Barry Bonds in left field, just like that. I, uh, <laughs> I you know, I get it. He's going to walk just as much as Barry Bonds with so, a better arm. So, Ugh. checkmate with with a faster <laughs> arm. He gets yeah. the ball in quickly. I don't, I don't think he has the strength, but he's very good at getting the ball into the infield. Rafey, this guy, if you look at Jerks and Profar's splits, it's not much different from the left and the right. It's not much different depending on what position he plays. There's very little difference between his splits. He is a 700 OPS guy who's going to get on base at like around uh, a, a 330 clip. It's 321 from the right 328 from the left so i i think you nailed it hitting sixth in a power position not ideal no as a guy on the team taking some days out there i love it i love him on the team i love what he's brought to it i love the smile damn it they needed it you can tell they needed it last year they needed somebody to defuse all the other bullshit like he's already doing this year so I don't think Jerks and Profar is a problem. I think Craig's point that they don't have the bat. And maybe it's coming when Manny plays third base. This roster is going to get jiggled around once the infield is set and DH, it becomes more of a question. I I, I feel that in my bones. I uh, Why we don't have Brandon Belt yet, that might be the only, the only reason. I don't know. But... I think that when Manny locks in uh, to first base, at uh, third base, hopefully soon, hopefully it's in April and not in May and not in June, then then that might give them reason to go with one more hitter because, as I pointed out, still 39 people on the 40-man roster. Well, I so. think Pauly has until then. I think Grand Pauly has until then to 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 win the job and be that hitter for this team. And if he can do that, then he gets the chance. And if he can't, we've got to, we've got to take a swing at Brandon belt because he's out there (laughs) being on podcasts saying that he's baffled why he can't get an offer and all of this. And let's bring him in and let him take a little pressure off of this lineup by being a a qualified left-handed bat that just like Profar is going to give you a good at bat, but unlike Profar, should hit 15 to 18 homers this year. You know, uh, I think we're one away and I'm willing to give up the ghost on fam. And if you were going to do a, a prop bet that Profar is going to outperform what Tommy fam would have done, I'm I'm willing at least to entertain the conversation. I, I think he brings sure. some things to this team, but not as our re- everyday six hitter. He, he can't be the everyday six. Hitter. I mean, agreed. And Campy can't be the everyday seventh hitter. I want to point out that Campusano is an absolute stud who has had um, an elaborate and intelligent approach at the plate. When you watch the guy, 00, even 01, and especially when he's ahead in the count, his stance allows him to take this gigantic first step. He has two swings, the giant first step when he's sitting fastball or ahead in the count, and then the stutter step when he's defending. That's when we saw him doing that absurd choke up on the bat. He'll get that foot down much earlier when behind in the count. It doesn't always lead to success. He struck out today doing the little stutter step, but dude has had a defined intelligence, intelligent and effective approach at the plate. I I can't be more stoked with where he's going. He should be hitting way further up in the lineup. Six at least. 
if not five, because he's going to he's going to knock in 90 guys this year if they move him up. Yeah. OK, I need to hop on the back of this because this goes back to our last conversation with Profar. Call me crazy. I would way rather have Graham Pauly hitting sixth right now than I would have Jerks and Profar hitting sixth. And the only reason that Camp Usano is hitting seventh is because they need a lefty to be in the sixth yeah. spot to break up the fact that there's no fucking lefties on this team right now. And so if you're going to put Campy fifth, that means putting Kim down seventh, which you could say that could be better, could be worse. It's kind of like, do you believe in Campy or do you believe in Kim more? It's just the issue right now with having Profar sixth is this is the exact point in the lineup last year where Matt Carpenter and Nelson Cruz were hitting. And what mm. happened? They had the first five guys come up, mm. they would all get on base, and they would ground into double plays, or they'd strike out, and nothing would happen. And that's my fear with the six spot staying in the hands of Jerks and Profar. And I think with Pauly, there's at least an upside there. There's at least that you could say, okay, maybe he'll develop into something that is legit. And like we know what Jerks and Profar is. We just do. Like, I mean, will he outperform Tommy Pham? Yeah. Will he outperform Tommy Pham? Maybe. Maybe if Pham was going to have a down year. But he's not going to exceed who he has been for the last decade. And so, like, for me, and I completely agree with you. I'm in love with Luis Campisano. Like, I, we, were, we were so, like, uh, I don't know, even know what the uh, analogical term that I'm trying to come up with. Like, we had Hedges, and then we had Nola. And it's like, this is what catchers do. And the idea that, like, you can just have a catcher who's literally has the highest OPS on the team right now, like, blows my mind. Like, truly blows my mind. So, I love him. I love the, um, what did you call the the stance he has, Chris? I can't remember. Samurai. It. The samurai. Uh, fuck it. Samurai stance is awesome. <laughs> like, just do it. Keep I was worried it. about it until I noticed that he did the stutter step. And it just shows that he's being measured. He's not going up there trying to to get as much um, torque and rotation in the swing as he possibly can by opening it up and getting the hands to a place where they can move through. No, it seems to me like he's more trying to see the ball now. And then once the step is up, he can either do his little stutter and sit. He's gotten a few singles on breaking pitches this way. Because he's not overcommitted on the big step. He's just got the little stutter and can just transfer through. So once I've noticed the the two definitive different swings he has, uh, the sky's the limit for that guy, man. Like, he could very well be on the National League All-Star team. I said that on Annie and Elston at one point a month ago, uh, talking to Sammy Levitt. And I'm just going to say, I think I don't think it's hyperbolic to state that he is one of the most under-discussed players in the National League right now because it was all about all of that, the the whisper campaign against this guy, you know, oh, the pitchers hate him, this and that. And I'm yeah. sure he was. I'm sure he was immature. I'm sure all of it had merit. I'm sure if I bring this up, Annie will say, no, no, people really didn't like him, something, 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 right? Like, that I'm, I'm sure it was real. I'm sure the personality issues were real. But this guy can hit. He can hit. He hit in the minor. He had a he had a batting title in the Cal League, didn't he? Didn't he win the batting title in the Cal League as a catcher? Like this is an actual hitter in baseball. And the fact that I mean, I I agree both that he should move up, but also that it's really good to have a hitter hitting seventh. That's good. Like <laughs> we're well, used to having only six good lineup and that's it. That's why I'm not worried about Hassan Kim moving down. Like I love the guy. He's it's my favorite Padre, but his hit tool is great in the seventh. He's a guy that gets on that can have extra base hits that can turn the lineup order over, you know, with the construction being Bogarts at the top, Kim doesn't have a natural, a natural spot. Like, I feel like you can put him anywhere and you're going to get a quality professional at bat. Yeah. The question is just, who do you want hitting behind Manny Machado? Do you want Luis Campisano or do you want a uh, Hassan Kim? And I think within the next couple of weeks, we'll get that answer in at least some form, even if it's just a two week sample size. And I'm just, I trust Mike Schilt to make the adjustment I, from everything that I've heard from Schilt. I really like him. I really like Mike Schilt, Mike Schilt for this team. Um, and uh, yeah, I, this I just goes back to I'm going to turn into a jerks and profile broken record 
but it's like okay like you know jokes and profar we it seems like i've swayed you guys that we should move we should have Polly hitting sixth i don't know but that means you're putting profar eighth and then at that point you have your left fielder hitting eighth in the lineup, which is like, then that's a problem. But you know I, what I, I mean? I know that's a, that's a problem value wise, but I don't care about that stuff, man. I don't care about his positional value. I care about his effectiveness on the team and the team grooving with him. Like I, I, I it's the same thing with Jay Cronenworth, you know, uh, if he's giving you a little bit of substandard first base uh, metrics, you know, value, and he's losing value by not playing there. I don't think that necessarily is a bad thing as long as he's being effective to some degree. And Profar is that like, if you put that, it's on the back of his baseball card, effective comma to some degree. All right. I want to make sure we get everything out. Uh, We're pretty much at the hour mark of the show. Uh, We've had, I saw, Rafi, you wrote down, why are we getting thrown out at home and on the bases so much? I, I think Mike Schilt wants us to be an aggressive base running team. Eggy Rosario made a, made a mistake. Uh, yeah, he talked you, about that. It was a contact play when Xander got thrown out at home. Uh, so, you know, you want the contact play to be run. You're going to be out sometimes, but you, you still want to run the contact play because you're going to be safe a lot of times, too. So I'm not worried about that. I'll take aggressive mistakes. And, and so will Schilt. He said that even about Eggy. He he defended Eggie. He's like, you know, I, I, in some ways I love it. Uh, you know, I don't love that he was out, but I'm, I'm glad he made an aggressive error. So I'm fine. I'm fine with that. Uh, and Chris, I agree that the game, I was just looking at your note, the game against bad pitchers or everything. Well, right. I mean, of course, right over the course well, of 162, you need to win the winnable games, beat up on the beat upable pitchers. And then if you, if you get, notched one night by a Jordan Hicks or a or Kyle Harrison, so be it, right? Yeah, and that's what it's felt like watching the Padres every like last year especially and in 2021, like when they got no hit by freaking Tyler Gilbert, is playing down to bad pitchers and and being sloppy in their approach. And we haven't seen any of that this year. Like even when it's been ineffective, their approach has been pretty solid and regimented. We've got three bad pitchers coming to town uh, wearing Cardinal red. And it's good. I think it's going to be an important series for, ta- for eating when food is on the table. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just to reiterate uh, and repeating what you had said earlier in the show, Chris, um, it's Kyle Gibson on Monday, Miles Nicholas on Tuesday and Zach Thompson on, uh, uh, on Wednesday. And, you know, Nicholas and, uh, Thompson got absolutely shelled by the Dodgers, just demolished. And uh, we haven't seen Kyle Gibson yet, but we kind of know who Kyle Gibson is. And so, like, these are three winnable games. You know, I don't know what kind of performance Matt Waldron is going to put in tomorrow. Um, I don't suspect the team is going to deploy him in the manner that I have been shouting for. And I know John Picotto has been shouting for they're not going to use him as the opener. He oh, is the oh, fifth starter. Oh, you want to see they're somebody gonna, from the bullpen come gonna. and throw He's in six pitch innings, a, a Quality start. That's why. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, hey, okay. If Matt Waldron gets a quality start tomorrow, we'll make a Waldron Cauldron t-shirt. How about that? Wow. Deal. And if he doesn't, we may still. We'll make a, wa- yeah, <laughs> we'll make a Waldron Cauldron t-shirt. We're still going to see a Waldron Cauldron t-shirt. Yeah. I'm excited. Knuckleballs. Let's throw the knuckleball 80% of the time. Who gives a shit? Let's do it. Can't wait. All right. uh, Last thing before we go. uh, I know you went to uh, the game, what, Saturday, right? Uh, Yes. Chris, pizza. What's up? Dude, I don't want to make this a complete uh, bitch fest, but I do know people with the Padres listen to this show. I know for a fact that Padres folks within the office listen to this show. And if the Padres are transitioning to a period in their franchise's existence where it's back to the ballpark experience, they're going to need to work on a few things, namely cooking their damn pizza, man. I bought my five-year-old a slice of cheese pizza from the pizza port. I know the discord told me that was a mistake immediately. I can live with bad pizza. This stuff was uncooked. I posted videos on the discord. I posted videos on Twitter. If any of you folks are with the Padres fan experience and want to improve it to a way that families can enjoy the game 
uh, and not feel bad about buying the $9 pizza and the $6, $16 beers, which I won't complain about. I go there for it. You got to cook the damn pizza. The fan experience at Peco has been slipping a little bit. Um, and we want to support our team. We want to love our team. But if it's truly hashtag for the faithful, you got to cook your damn pizza. Here, here. Dude, two slices of uncooked dough, like stretchy, uncooked pizza dough. Like I posted videos, but you like you took off the cheese, then there was sauce, and you pulled it out, and it was like stretchy, uncooked dough. I took one slice back. Guy tried to hand me two more. I only took one. I'm like, yeah, we don't want two. Opened it up, same thing. Just a disaster. I don't know if they have a broken oven. It could be isolated, but let us know in the Discord, folks, or let the Padres know on Twitter if you got uncooked pizza. Because they can't be doing that. We want to be Padres fans. I am sorry for your loss <laughs> of pizza. I well, Chris, I I get it though because I think that the fan experience at Peco is like borderline sacred, like yeah. for Padres fans, because like that was the one thing that when the team was so shitty for so long, we we could hang on to, and to like to be like oh, we're investing in the team more on the field, which they're obviously not this year compared to last year. So like then other parts of it slip like, no, it's like I it, it's it, it's not as important to me as the team being good. Sure. But it's Same it's here. really close. Like it's really it's close. Part of our Padres fan experience. And this is the Padres hot tub where, you know, folks with the birthright of loving this team come to express their disappointments and frustrations. And I, like I said, I won't get frustrated by beer prices. I know what I'm signing up for. Um, I love the new Gallagher Square edition. Seeger was in that gigantic ass tower of a playground uh, all through Cosgrove's meltdown. So I only had to watch that on the screen. It was great. Um, but to have when to try to feed your kid dinner and he only eats a few things to not be able to do that at the ballpark is frustrating. And I've come on here and I've said how great the nursing suite is. I've come up here and extolled the Padres when they've gone above and beyond for the fan experience. And I'm going to do the same thing when they let us down like that. And it was, it was, you know, nine bucks and a hungry kid. But at the end of the day, that keeps him from wanting to go back. I, I didn't, I, I know I was being a little bit glib, but oh, you're, no, I, listen, I, I completely yeah. agree. We've talked about this on banter before, so this is a leak over to the main podcast. The inshittification of our society and everything within it, that's an example. I do not need to hear stories about the inshittification about Petco, of Petco Park. And by that, I don't mean that don't tell me the story. I mean, I don't want that to be a story that's real. So let's get that right. You know, I mean, Rick Romero wants to give me a guff for saying that the Cardiff tri-tip nachos aren't as good as they used to be. They're not as good as they used to be. <laughs> They're not. They, I mean, they aren't. And, and like, that's not a rip on Seaside Market or, you know, I know HJ said some stuff about Grand Old. Like, it's not a rip of Grand Old. It's not the same thing as if you go to one of their restaurants or, or to their actual physical location Sure. What you're getting at Petco Park is not the same quality right now. And listen, not trying to rip them. I love pizza port, but if I got a raw pizza slice, I'd be pissed off too. Yeah. Like you said, Craig, it, it, it very much follows Corey Doctorow's and shitification model. They open it up. Everything's great. It's the best in the entire country. They captivate you with a great team. And the experience, and then they feel they don't have to invest in it like they once did. And I, it's just a note for the Padres folks. Like, you're entering a new phase where it's not rapturous excess spending and fully commit, fully, full commitment to the highest payroll in the league, do everything it takes to win. And a lot of us understand that and will completely accept it. We're Padres fans. We, like I said, our birthright is suffering. But you you got to serve edible food. It has to be edible. Okay. That's a mantra that we want to live by here at Padres Hot Tip as well. <laughs> <laughs> so It's got to be edible. Hopefully this was an edible podcast. 
And if not, uh, we hope to make it a little bit tastier next time. Thank well, you for want supporting the, the show. To eat against the Cardinals, so I want that to be edible too. I want yes. Miles Michaelis to be delicious. Oh, the the snake charmer pitcher. We're yes, eating Spankapita. I love it. Say it. All right, guys. We'll be back with group therapy after the Cardinals series is done and heading into the Giants series over the weekend. Until then, everybody enjoy the week. Hope to see some of y'all out at Petco Park on Monday night. Go Padres.